night may be long and the dark may be deep, but the answers are there to be found. Whether it's the normal, the abnormal, or the paranormal, you're in the right place. Let's go beyond reality. Welcome to the show. Great to have everybody along. Uh, oops, I did it again. Isn't that a Britney Spears song? Yeah, uh, the uh, the actual title of the book we're going to be talking about talking about tonight is I Did It to Myself Again. Uh, but I don't know. I got it confused with the Britney Spears song. I'm like, isn't that a song by Britney Spears? Close. Anyway, we've got a good show lined up for you tonight. I'm excited to have Joanne DiMaggio join us. Joanne uh, was supposed to be on, I think it was last week, and we had a con- little bit of confusion in the schedule, and we had to postpone that interview, but we've got it tonight for you. She is going to talk about dying, the afterlife, and reincarnation, and more importantly, the life between lives. Again, her book is called I Did It to Myself Again, but she's also got books including Karma Can Be a Real Pain and Your Soul Remembers, also soul writing. We're going to talk about all that stuff in tonight's conversation. Looking forward to it. Before we get any further in the show, though, I want to uh, say a big thank you to Craig Pete. Craig uh, is a new supporter on our Patreon support page, and thank you so much, Craig, for uh, doing that for us. It helps us a lot. We do appreciate the support. Also, the very kind words that you sent along with that. So thank you, sir. Um, what else do we need to talk about? Just the standard uh, things. Make sure you go to the YouTube page and subscribe. It's uh, youtube.com slash JV Johnson. Actually, it might be, yeah, it's JV Johnson. But if you need to search for it, just look for JV Johnson's Beyond Paranormal. Also, the podcast is well worth subscribing to. It's a great way to get the program automatically downloaded to your smart device, whether it's your phone or tablet. You can subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and many, many other uh, primary podcast distribution points. And also our Twitch page, getting a lot of traction there. That's going to be mostly for our weekend shows when we have a little bit more uh, casual approach to our broadcasts. But it's still a great place to be. And if you've uh, if you've joined us on Twitch, thank you for doing that. And also, if you've subscribed on Twitch, thank you very much. If you have an Amazon Prime account, you can subscribe to the to our Twitch channel. And there's no fee or anything. It just links to your Amazon account. I think you have to renew it each month. You've got to resubscribe each month for that Prime uh, link to continue. But it's a great way, again, to be part of that community because we've got some pretty cool... Uh, subscriber emotes and stuff that people can use and you earn double points when you're a subscriber all that stuff so it's a lot of fun and we will be um, again revisiting some of those games during our booze brews and bros program which will be coming up friday night Uh, let's go to break let's get our guest with us joanne dimaggio will be joining us in just a few moments it's beyond reality Please support the program go to patreon.com slash joha that's j-o-h-a-w I've had trouble keeping track of the days recently. I don't know if it's this social uh, distancing isolation thing that's going on or if it's just my memory, which it's probably the latter. It's probably just my memory. I can't remember which day it is. Anyway, welcome to uh, back to the show. We've got a great one for you tonight. We're going to be talking about all sorts of things, mystical and spiritual, particularly as it comes to your soul, it comes to the afterlife, and more importantly, the life between lives. Our guest tonight, Joanne DiMaggio, is with us. She's written many books, including I Did It to Myself Again. Joanne, welcome to Beyond Reality. Great to have you with us tonight. Thanks so much. I'm really thrilled to be here. It's it's a pleasure having you. I know we had a little bit of a snafu because you were scheduled before, a little miscommunication, but we finally got you on the show and we're excited. Tell us a little bit about your path. Uh, you know, not everybody uh, finds themselves talking about past lives souls and afterlife and the life between lives, but that's what you do. Tell us how you got there. Well, I've been interested in this topic uh, since the uh, late 80s. Actually, it was Shirley MacLaine's um, book, uh, Out on a Limb, that when they turned it into a miniseries back in 1987, uh, that sparked my interest in in the past life aspect of her book and and the miniseries. Um, I had, before that, as a teenager, I was reading books by Ruth Montgomery and books about Edgar Cayce, and and so I always had an interest in uh, reincarnation. It made a lot of sense to me, Uh, but I didn't seriously pursue it as a profession until the early 90s. Um, And uh, I started... um, my own uh, past life research organization when I lived outside of Chicago and uh, have been really 
uh, devoted to doing research primarily. Um, I started doing regression work uh, a little bit later on. Uh, I had so many uh, colleagues in the field who said to me, why aren't you doing regressions? You should, you know more about this than most people. And I thought, well, you know, I always thought I was a, mostly a writer. I, I like to identify myself as a reporter for the universe, so I like to go and do the research, find out what everybody's doing, then write about it. Uh, but uh, I, I took a little bit of a turn and decided I would uh, pursue uh, my master's in transpersonal studies through Atlantic University, uh, got my hypnotherapy certification, and so now I combine actually doing the regression work with, um, with the research, and then that then becomes the books that I'm publishing. Let's talk about some of the definitions of words that you just used in that explanation or that answer that'll help us out as we continue our discussion. First of all, in your dictionary, if you will, what does the word reincarnation mean? It means uh, subsequent lifetimes, um, returning uh, to life in a human body, because we're spiritual beings having a human uh, experience. So when we reincarnate, our spirits come back into a human body to continue with the uh, earthly experience that we're having. Does that indicate or mean that the soul is eternal? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's kind of the cornerstone of the whole thing, isn't it? It is. It is. Um, we were all created at the same time, which comes to sometimes a little bit of a surprise to people who like to think about old souls versus young souls. We're, there's no such thing as an old soul. We were all created at the same time, um, but some of us are uh, what I call, I, I like to call old souls slow learners because we come back over and over and over again because we don't quite get the lesson, so we have to come back and repeat it. Um, and so um, that's what gives us the, gives people the impression that we're old souls because of the wisdom that we uh, seem to have, and that's just from earthly experiences that we've accumulated over many lifetimes. And as we talk about things like afterlife, is mm -hmm. is that a another word for heaven or is it something different? You know, it's interesting. In my study, nobody described the afterlife as heaven, um, nor did they say that they experienced anything like a purgatory or a hell. Uh, the afterlife is actually... Um, our true home. It's our spirit home. It's where our soul goes between li earthly lifetimes or lifetimes elsewhere. But when we're not in a physical form, um, this is where we are, and this is where we go to rest. This is where we go to learn. This is where we go to plan out the, the, the next lifetime that we're going to have. So it's leaving, the, at, at the point of death, you're leaving the earth plane and you're going into spirit. Um, and that was really the point of my whole research project about what, do, what is that like? What does that look like? What's the process feel like? What do you do when you're there? But, and you stay there as long as you uh, have the need to, and then when you have the opportunity to come back, when all the circumstances are perfect for your reentry so that you can learn the lessons that you have uh, laid out during your life between life session with uh, the Council of Elders, then then you come back to the earth and and stay here for as long as you need to learn whatever lesson, and then you go, the cycle goes right back to the beginning again. Is there a reason to feel like that cycle is a little uh, monotonous in a way? I don't know if that's the right word. Um, it must not be because the majority <laughs> of the people that I interviewed in my study said that they wanted to come back. They had yeah. a very strong desire to return. Um, Every lifetime is so different from the one before it that it's a, it's a great learning experience uh, for us, and it's also a great adventure. I need to quote something, or I'm going to kind of quote, but also a little paraphrase something you have on your website that I want to ask you about. You say writing is a part of your spiritual DNA. Your soul's <laughs> mission in this life is to observe, record, and disseminate information about soul writing and past life explora exploration. How did you how did you learn that that was your mission? Um, I think that the uh, internal work that I do, uh, examining my own past lives, I discovered that there was a pattern there, and and that's true with everybody. Uh, that's why past life work is so valuable. And the pattern was that I have done this sort of work before. 
um, having been a scribe or a reporter or a writer or in some some way, shape, or form, I've been an observer writing things down and, and sharing that with others. So I felt that this was something that I um, have come into life to do. Uh, in my own Life Between Life session, I saw that that was part of the plan, was to do that again this time. So it's just, um, that, like I said, that's the value of doing this sort of work, to find out what's your soul's purpose, uh, where, what are you being led to do. And certainly writing has been, for me, since a, a young child, uh, has been the great joy of my life. And then when you use the phrase, phrase spiritual DNA, is that something, a, a term that you've coined, or is there something more to that? Um, I, I don't. I don't know if I read it somewhere or if I made it up, to be honest with you, uh, but it just felt like that to me at the time that I was writing that, that this was part of who I was. It, um, you know, I really haven't done any studies about uh, whether we have any spiritual DNA or, or not, but I'm sure we do if we were to look at it from that perspective. Um, you know, so many people now want to have... Um, you know, DNA tests to look at their ancestry. But, you know, if you want to do a soul or a spiritual DNA, you're going to have to do a lot more than swab your cheek. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's <laughs> a lot more to it than that. And uh, one last question about these kind of definition things. You also talk about esoteric studies. That's mm -hmm. part of the work you do. Mm -hmm. Is that a discipline or, again, is that, a, is that a way that you've come to coin what you do? No, it's a, it's more of a discipline. So, Esoteric are the things that are outside of us. Um, I'm not one for definitions, but um, it's a, another term for metaphysical work, um, it's looking at, into the spiritual, the deeper meaning of, of life. Um, all that falls under that category. When we talk about people leaving this existence, mm -hmm. uh, being in the life between lives, as you've, as you've pointed out, um, and then coming back, very few people come back with the ability to recall what happened in their previous life without help from people like you. Uh, it takes someone like you to help guide these memories back. Why is that? What's the point of living multiple lives if you can't bring some of that information with you that's easily accessible? Well, actually, it is easily accessible for people. There are many methods other than working with somebody like me where you can get it. And people get information all the time. They're getting clues. Uh, every day. It's just that they're not aware of it or they're not thinking in, the, in, line, in line with that. But a deja vu experience is a memory trigger. Um, that's one of the things we explored in my research project, that we're given these memory triggers before we come into our physical existence. And then when they, they get sparked, um, and it could be a piece of music, it could be uh, a, a landscape or a country you might visit or a historic locale. It could be flowers. It could be colors. Any number of things will trigger a memory, um, and or you'll, you'll have that feeling of deja vu. Uh, that's all tied together. Those are all the ways the universe is saying, here, there's a little bit more for you to take a look at. But you have to have the, the willingness uh, to want to dig a little deeper. And most people, um, especially in the Western Hemisphere, um, aren't thinking along those lines, and so they don't really spend the time to do that more profound inner work. So, again, that, that's a very important point. When you are uh, living your daily life and you have maybe things like a hunch or a gut mm -hmm. feeling or uh, the, the sense that, hey, I've been here before or some of these senses that we don't often know where they come from. They just seem somehow in, innate to us. You're mm -hmm. suggesting that many of those could, in fact, come from experiences in past lives. Oh, sure. If, you ever, if you've ever met somebody that you instantly dislike them, they didn't even have to get past the hello, my name is. There was just something about them that really bothered you. Uh, on the other hand, it, it, it could be the complete opposite, where you meet somebody and you just fall in love with them instantly. There's something about them. You, you resonate to them. You look into their eyes, and it just seems a little on the familiar side. Um, so we get these clues um, on, a, on a daily basis. We just need to be detectives to figure out uh, what they mean.
So that must mean that I've been in a lot of people's past lives because people dislike me instantly most of the time. So that, <laughs> <laughs> so that must explain it. It's not me. It's my past life me right. that's doing it. Um, tell us about your work with uh, the Edgar, Ed, Edgar Casey uh, group. Well, I became involved with Edgar Casey, the uh, ARE, the Association for Research and Enlightenment, which was founded by Mr. Casey in 1931. Um, and they're in Virginia Beach, Virginia, so they're not too far from where I am, about three hours away. I became involved when I was still living in Chicago. They were forming um, uh, regional uh, centers, and we were, we were doing one in the Chicago area, so I got involved. Um, and since I had a background in writing and public relations and advertising and marketing, I was doing that sort of work on a volunteer basis for them then. Uh, and I got more and more involved with the Casey material. Um, for your uh, listeners who don't know who Edgar Casey is, he was probably the most renowned psychic mystic of the 20th century. He gave 14,000 readings while in a trance. Most of those, 12,000 of those, were health readings. And that's why he's considered the father of holistic medicine. But 2,000 of them were life readings, and that's where he started to get the information about past lives. Um, so I, uh, I've been involved with them ever since then, about 1990, I think that started uh, my involvement. And then I um, attended the uh, uh, Atlantic University, which is also... Um, founded by Mr. Casey at the same time that he founded the ARE, uh, and that's, um, so I furthered my studies. I spent three years um, on my master's degree, and, uh, and I'm still involved with them. I'm, um, I head up a, uh, here in Charlottesville, Virginia area, we have uh, ARE-related programs while bringing speakers, um, and we meet over at the uh, Unity of Charlottesville Church. Uh, and so, um, so I've got my foot in both worlds in unity, as well as uh, ARE. Uh, we all know that Edgar Casey was a very special individual, and, and his work was beyond groundbreaking for sure. But mm -hmm. some people go beyond that. Some people believe that he uh, actually had a spiritualness that many don't possess, or in some cases, some have called him an ascended master, or some of the you know these other greater uh, beings or greater exist existences. Do you th believe any of that, or think any of that? Well, I think he was an exceptional, an extraordinary human being. I don't think that we've ever had anyone um, come to his level since he left us in 1945. Um, but he was also a, a, an ordinary man with a family and um, liked to go fishing out in the pier. I don't know how many Ascended Masters go fishing, but <laughs> he did. <laughs> um, but some of the some of his beautiful stories I've read about his personal life, uh, you know, he's very much grounded in, in his humanness. When he did those readings, by the way, he did not remember anything when he awoke from them. Um, but he and, and he was a very Christian man. He read the Bible one year for every year of his life. Um, and he just uh, had this extraordinary ability to be able to read um, uh, a person's Akashic record uh, and to scan the body and go to his source. You had to ask him a question. It wasn't like he was, you know, just professing all this knowledge like some channelers do. But he would, you'd ask him a question, he would go to his source get the answer, and then um, he'd say that out loud, and then his secretary would be transcribing those readings, which, by the way, the original readings are still available in the library at the ARE in Virginia Beach, but you can also, members can access them online. You would just type in a subject, and boom, there it is, uh, Casey's answer to it. So it's uh, quite remarkable. Yeah, that's a great resource. By the way, I love the area. If you're still in the Charlottesville area, it's a beautiful beautiful area of the country it is i i it's really funny because i came here um uh in 1995 i had uh was born and raised in chicago but i never felt like that was home it was like my soul was yearning to be someplace else and it wasn't until i came to virginia after college that that i felt this collective sigh of relief like oh this is where i'm supposed to be which again is another past life um you know, is, uh, issue that comes up for a lot of people that they're they don't feel like they're in the right place, uh, and 
but they don't necessarily know what the right place is. So we can kind of go in there and examine um, what areas that they may resonate to. Some people take vacations in the same spot over and over and over again um, because they love it so much. Well, it could be that they had a past life there, and that's just a remnant of that memory. Do people uh, reincarnate within soul groups or families? And, and I mean, when I say families, it could be a soul family or it could be blood family. It's primarily a soul family. I, we travel in pods almost um, where the same souls reincarnate together over and over again. But they change sex. They change their relationship to you so that your father in this life could have been your sister in a previous life or your husband in this life or your wife in this life could have been your parent in another life. We just change roles, but it's primarily the same soul group that travels together. It's very rare that you incarnate in this um, in the same biological family that you had in a prior lifetime. So in other words, you know, you all come together again, but it's in a different biological family. Joanne, as you learned this and researched this and worked with people about this, how amazed were you when you started to get these uh, revelations and these realizations? You know, I really was humbled by this work. Um, what I, when I set out to do this particular research study, I wanted to see... Um, there were three reasons I did it, and, and one was because people had a tendency to be blamed. My clients would come in, and they'd have a tendency to blame, oh, you know, it's all my mother's fault or my father's fault or my husband's fault, and they didn't take self-responsibility. And I knew that, that they planned this lifetime, so I, I really wanted to get into that a little bit further, and I wanted to compare what I was finding with existing research but most of all, I wanted to see, is there a common experience here? And this is what blew me away, because I thought for sure that every single one of them was going to come and describe something completely different from what the person before or after them said. And the 25 people that I used for my research project, plus all the people that I had worked with in the Life Between Life sessions as clients, they all were coming back with the same uh, information. They, they saw the same thing. They experienced the same thing. Um, the, the whole process was almost identical. I mean, there were little, little changes here and there depending on what their soul was, was working on. But that's what surprised me the most. And I thought, well, if this is a common experience among everybody, then there's, there's really nothing to fear about death. Because these people are giving you the blueprint of what, what, what you're going to experience on the other side. And it was beautiful, and it was nothing to be afraid of. And account after account after account was the same type of message, and it was very uplifting, very encouraging, very inspiring. And uh, like I said, it was a very humbling experience for me to be part of their journey, um, especially because it made such a difference in their current life when they uncovered all of this about what went on in their life between life session. Most people have a bit of a fear of death mm -hmm. and the unknown that follows death. And in many cases, people fear that it's the end. Uh, did you feel that way prior to learning this? Um, no, I knew it wasn't the end, but I didn't know what it would be like. I, I, I knew that the soul was eternal but what happens when I take my last breath to when I breathe anew as a baby? In that in-between period, I didn't have a clue what was going on because I was born and raised Catholic. So I had the whole, you know, image of, of the afterlife is, uh, you know, um, this is a one-time deal. And, you know, you meet St. Peter at the pearly gates, and he says, okay, you go to my left, you go to my right. Um, and then you had the heaven, hell, or purgatory choices. It was nothing like that, and it was um, so reassuring uh, that um, even though I, I'm not looking forward to, to leaving the earth plane in, in this life because I, I uh, have so, many, so much work I still want to do on this side of the veil, um, I don't have the fear um, that I had, I think, before when I was growing up. 
do you think your uh, upbringing as a Catholic, I was also brought up Catholic, uh, is at odds with these new ideas, or do you think they can be compatible? Mm, I don't. I, I think that reincarnation is still not accepted by the Church. Right. One of the reasons I belong to Unity is because, um, let's face it, what church would allow me to be doing regressions on their on their campus, you know, church campus? I have an office actually over there at the uh, Unity Holistic Healing Center, uh, which I also I founded and I had that up. Um, so um, yeah, when I was growing up, I always thought that that some of what I was being told didn't make any sense to me as far as what a a loving and just God, how He would treat His creations. And, um, you know, the idea of if you, you know, you make this one mistake and you don't confess it, you go straight to hell. I mean, you only get this one chance. And I thought, how can you possibly accomplish everything in, in just the span of one lifetime, especially if you die relatively young? So there was a lot. And I, and I went to 12 years of Catholic school, so you can imagine... Um, as I got older, when I became a teenager, I kept raising my hand in religion class and saying, but, uh, you know, and immediately I'd get a detention. <laughs> so, um, so you know, I didn't think that I'd find um, the welcome mat uh, for what I'm, uh, what I'm discovered and, and what I now believe to be uh, the true essence of our soul's journey. We're talking tonight with Joanne DiMaggio. Uh, her website is her name, joannedimaggio.com. We're talking about specifically her book called I Did It To Myself Again. That's her new book. She's got many other books to her credit as well about similar topics. Joanne, when um, you first started working with people and helping them through a past life regression, what's the process? What do you have to do to help them remember uh, some of this past life information? Well, I serve as their guide, so... Um, uh, uh, working with them to enable them to get into a very relaxed state of mind and just to let go and to allow spirit to show them, like in movie format, um, a significant past life. I always ask the soul ahead of time uh, to take them to the one life that's impacting them now because we've had a lot of hundreds of past lives so you're you're not working on everything from every lifetime there's one specific one that that you've brought karmic issues into this life to resolve and heal um and so i use a very long relaxation process in the beginning i use a lot of visualization um take them across a bridge uh the bridge of timeless time when they get to the other side you know i tell them you're you're now you know in the body that you inhabited in your in this significant past life, and then I then I turn it around and I start asking them questions because I really want I don't want to spoon feed anything to them. I don't want I'm not a reader. I'm not telling them who they were or what they were doing. I want them to tell me. So then I start asking. This is where the reporter comes in. I start asking them questions. You know, look down at your feet. Uh, are they bare? Or are they covered? What, what clothes are you wearing? What color is your hair? Uh, what is your body makeup like? Um, are you inside? Are you outside? Describe the landscape to me. I mean, I ask a series of questions to get a picture of who they are. And then I ask their soul to scan that life and pick out the most significant event that um, was so important that it made an imprint on their soul and they brought it into this life to work on. So then they t start telling me the story of, of their lifetime. And so we have a conversation about that. Um, and then I'll ask questions about are there any people from that life that are in your life now? And if they are in your life now, what role are they playing? Are there any patterns or parallels between that life and this one? Um, you know, what were your last thoughts when you died? Because that often sets up the next lifetime. Um, this one story I like to tell is I had a woman who had head to toe psoriasis. She came in. Uh, she wanted to know what was the source of the psoriasis. This is when I was doing my karma can be a real pain uh, research for that book. Um, and uh, so we found out that she had been a call girl in the Old West. And at the moment of death, I asked what her last thought was, and she said, I don't want to be touched anymore. And so she comes into this life and she manifests a skin condition in which nobody wants to touch her. So I, I have 
story after story like oh, wow. that. But they once they see that, that that's where the healing can take place. Yeah, I was just so going to ask: does, does that does that give them a way to heal uh, with having that information? Often it does. I had a significant percentage in that research project. I had 50 people come in with various chronic illnesses to find out if the illness had its origin in a prior lifetime. And I would tell you that the majority um, did say that that just finding out um, created a healing for them. The healing could have been not necessarily where the condition completely disappeared, but it changed their perspective on it. So they understood where this came from. And often just understanding the source is part of the healing process. We have to go to break here in just a couple minutes, but before we do, uh, we did have a question scroll through our chat room. Do you ever have, uh, I don't know if you call them patients or if you call them people that you're just uh, counseling or whatever it is, anyone that you could, clients, great, Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, You ever have a client that you couldn't get into the past life regression, they just couldn't come up with it? Yes. So that Uh, does happen. Is it common? It's not common, but it does happen. And... I, I work with them. I have three different scripts that I use so that if one doesn't work, I'll switch it up and, and take them in, like, through the back door or, you know, the side door or whatever. I work with them for quite a while. If they get nothing, it's because they're, they're, it's being blocked. They're either blocking it out of fear or spirit may be blocking it, thinking they're not ready for this yet. Uh, so, um, so, yes, that does happen. And they're always very disappointed, and I am too. But uh, I tell them to go home and um, really work on learning to meditate. That's the key. Um, because many of them, they say they, they just can't let go and get into that deep, uh, deeper state of relaxation uh, where their subconscious mind can come up, and, and that's where all the information on the past lives uh, originates. So, um, so we do work, but it does happen, yes. Absolutely. When we have uh, a loved one whose soul is crossed over before reincarnation, and I don't know how what the time span is between someone leaving Earth through what we would call death, and mm-hmm. then having them being reincarnated. I don't know if it's if it's minutes, days, years, centuries. I mean, maybe you can answer that first before I follow up the question. Sure. It's generally on average between fifty and two hundred years between lives, unless it's a suicide or they've been killed prematurely. The ones who commit suicide or are killed prematurely um, tend to come back almost immediately. Uh, The other ones, usually between 50 and 200 years. Okay. So during that span of time where a soul is in the life between lives, uh, do they uh, coalesce around family members or, or part of their soul family, as you described earlier, and guide and help those people while they're still here on earth um they 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 stay with their soul cluster group uh and some of them do become spirit guides for the ones in the physical realm um others just volunteer to come in with them to they'll say um okay i'm going to come in when you go back into the uh human life, I'm going to come back in with you as your father, mother, sister, brother, whatever, and this is what I'm going to do to help you with whatever karmic issue. So in other words, if, you, if your issue is abandonment and you're coming in, so I'm going to go back to earth and I'm going to work on this issue of abandonment, well, chances are members of your soul family are going to say to you, okay, we're going to come in with you and we're going to help you with that by abandoning you at some point in your life, uh, which sounds cruel. Uh, but it, but on a soul level, it isn't because that they're helping them uh, learn learn that lesson. Um, if it's about uh, issues of approval or um, uh, you know uh, acceptance or approval, they'll say, "Well, we're going to come in, and nothing you can do will ever get us to accept or approve you." Why? Because the lesson for that soul is that acceptance and approval comes from within and from above. So those souls are coming in to assist them to learn that lesson. Uh, Tonight we're talking with Joanne DiMaggio about her book, I Did It to Myself Again. But, Joanne, there's an 800-pound gorilla in the room, and I have to get this out of the way. Uh Uh-oh. My last name is Johnson, so people ask me, are you related to, you know, so-and-so Johnson in Kentucky? I'm like, you've got to be kidding me, right? (laughs) 
<laughs> but I've got to ask you because I, I'm in Cooperstown, New York, the home of baseball. Any relation oh. to Joe DiMaggio? <laughs> No, I'm sorry to say. Okay, well, I just had but, to get it out of the way. But I used to tease people and say, you know, when I, and they'd ask me that, I'd say, yeah, you should have seen my Aunt Marilyn. But, <laughs> That's funny. That's yeah. really funny. That's great. Um, tell me about the title of the book, I Did It to Myself Again. Yeah, that came from uh, the what I mentioned earlier about the tendency of my clients to blame others for the way that their life was going. So... I knew they were the ones who carefully planned their lives to, you know, correspond to the lessons that their soul needed for growth. So I hoped if they saw that for themselves, they'd embrace their life from an entirely different perspective. So, uh, you know, don't don't blame mom and dad. You did it to yourself. You planned this yourself. This was all part of your doing. Uh, everything from picking your parents out to uh, the kind of body that you have. So uh, that's where that came from. If people have the opportunity in between their lives to pick parents and kind of in some way uh, manipulate their circumstances or determine their circumstances is a better way, why do people then come into those lives and why is there so much unhappiness? Or maybe it's angst between parents and children. Uh, How does that happen? Well, your parents are the most important people that you're working with because your parents set up the opportunities for your soul to, to grow. So, in other words, you'll pick your mom and dad. You may have had, you may have been with them in a prior lifetime. So you may be working on some karmic issues with each other. You know, oh, um, that you know, you might have been mistreated. Um, uh, you might have been dealing with uh, poverty or uh, illness or something. Or, um, the relationship, you didn't have love or whatever the relationship issue might be. And you've decided, oh, I'm going to try these people again so that we can work on this. So in picking those parents, you're going to know exactly where you're going to be living. You're going to know the, um, you know, the city you're going to be in, the neighborhood you're going to be in. You're going to know about the extended family, the relatives. You're going to know about, you know, the probability of you going to this school, uh, all of the possibilities are going to be there ahead of time, so you'll know. Now, that being said, you do have free will. At any given point in time, you can decide to shift your life into a different direction. Um, but the parents are, are the pivotal role players in, the, in that very beginning stages, so that selection is is uh, really important. And of all the people in my study, I asked them whether they were happy that they picked the parents that they did, even if it was a rough go of it with them. And they all, without exception, said yes, that the parents fulfilled the, the purpose that they were assigned to fulfill for that child. So um, so it's really kind of fascinating. It's it, There's so many layers to it, you know, and um, just watching it all come together like this beautiful mosaic, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. There aren't a lot of people that have taken the subject this far and researched it and experimented and worked with people about uh, with these topics. Um, mm-hmm. but, but there are others, including Dr. Michael Newton. Tell, talk about his work a little bit. Well, I had heard of Dr. Newton's work, and so I, um, uh, before I started this study, uh, uh, I very anxiously got every single one of his books and started to read uh, what his research was all about, what his findings were. Um, Especially I was interested in how his viewpoint um, coalesced with Mr. Casey's point of view. Uh, And I was surprised at the number of times that in the column of the, the page I'd write the word no, which you know, I'd read something and I go, no way, that isn't true, that isn't right. And that surprised me because I'm not that kind of a person. I, I don't normally, I'm not that judgmental. Uh, and I wonder, well, what's going on here? So there were things that he had, had come up with that I found were not in line with the Casey material, and they were not in line with what I was uh, discovering. So... Um, so I thought, well, you know, I, I really, one of the things he said was that he realized that there would be past life therapists who would come after him who would take this 
to the next step. And uh, so I decided that um, that that's what I was going to do. So that's why I um, formulated this research group, just so that I could find out for myself, um, you know, what what was true for my group of people as opposed to what what his findings were. One of the things that, that often scares people is the concept of, of hell uh, or some type of punishment after the existing mm-hmm. life, which you've kind of already dispelled in, from, from what you've said earlier. But at the same time, that's still a fear that grips people. Is, are there any consequences to your actions here on Earth in a given lifetime that either play out in the, in the in-between part or in the next life? They don't play out in the in-between part because whatever is whatever happens on Earth, what's begun on Earth needs to be completed on the Earth. So the in-between is like um, if you think of the Earth as a school and that we're all coming to school to learn things. Um, we're, we're we're learning things that we can't learn when we're in our spiritual bodies because you know we're on a whole different energy frequency. Um, so coming into a physical body, coming to the earth, we have all these classes that we can take. And, uh, that's when the council of elders comes in because they're the ones who are like the equivalent of guidance counselors at school. So they sit down with you and they look at all your past lives. It's like they're spread out like report cards uh, on the, on the desk. And they're saying, you know, you didn't do too well in this class on responsibility, maybe you should think about repeating that class. But then they'll also say, let's look at all the classes that you passed, all the attributes that you've acquired, uh, you know, and you can bring all those with you and that'll help you to work on these classes that you're signing up for. So you sign up for maybe three or four classes. Mr. Casey um, never gave anybody more than, I believe, four past lives to work on because he said it was simply too much. You wouldn't be able to to handle all of that. So, um, so then um, that, that decision on what you're going to work on uh, influences the choice of parents, the sole family members who come in, the body that you choose, the memory triggers that you're given, it all, and then most of all your soul's purpose, your, your, your soul's mission statement, so to speak. And uh, all that gets tucked away in your little backpack, and then you're sent back to the earth and and uh, and begin your your education. And I know you've touched on some of this already, but it, but help me with the differences between what we would call past lives and then this life between lives time. Mm-hmm. The past lives refer to the lifetimes that you've had on the earth in a human body. Um, so my my the people in my study went back two thousand years, some of them. Um, and so you've had these lifetimes, say you've had an Egyptian lifetime, and then you had a medieval lifetime, and then you had one during the Revolutionary War, or any, any point along the way. Those are your past lives. That's when you're in a physical body. The afterlife is when you pass away from that particular lifetime. You enter into the spirit realm, and you, this is your resting point, it's like your you know a way station. You kind of rest there. You you work with the, your your uh, ascended masters, your guides, your angels, whatever you want to call them, and they help you to assemble this uh, curriculum. And then you so then you come back into life, and then you start a new lifetime. We're talking with Joanne DiMaggio tonight. Her book is a new book, and it's called I Did It to Myself Again. Before we uh, go to break here at the top of the hour, tell me a little bit about some of your other work, too. Karma can be a real pain. Also, your soul remembers and soul writing. Talk talk a little bit about that for a sec. Well, soul writing was the first book that I wrote, and that was actually my thesis for um, my master's degree at Atlantic University. Soul writing is a written form of meditation, uh, and... Um, it's something Mr. Casey talked a lot about uh, when he gave readings, but he called it inspirational writing at the time. Uh, and um, this is a wonderful tool that anybody can learn, and, and it's just um, a stream of consciousness writing while you're in an altered state of consciousness. 
Uh, and I often tack that on to a past life regression at the end because you could get some additional information. The Your Soul Remembers was the next uh, book, and that one was about how you can use soul writing to learn to access your past life information. You don't need to go to somebody like me. You can pretty much do it on your own. Uh, just go into this altered state of consciousness, say a prayer of protection, surround yourself with white light, put the pen down and the paper, and then wait for a message. It's not automatic writing. I, I, it's the opposite of automatic writing. Um, and Casey did not recommend automatic writing to anybody. Uh, so there is a difference, and I explore that difference in, in the books. And then the karma can be a real pain, as I mentioned earlier, was um, exploring uh, chronic illnesses in people to see if they were past life related. And they're all available on Amazon? They are, yes. Again, I encourage you to visit the YouTube channel and subscribe. YouTube.com slash JV Johnson is the easiest way to find it or search for JV Johnson. A great way to uh, participate. We've got about 500 back episodes of the show there that you can watch or listen to or both. And subscription is, uh, there's no charge or anything for that. We encourage you to do that. So a lot of great stuff coming up. And again, tonight we're talking with Joanne DiMaggio, and we're having a great conversation about the life between lives, plus the afterlife, plus reincarnation. These are all things that are rather important to not just us individually, but man, if our soul is eternal, this is this is what it's all about. Joanne, you, you said in the beginning of our conversation that all souls were created at the same time. So is that a fixed number of souls? There's never any ebb and flow in that number? I don't know the number that were created at the beginning. The The reason the numbers change is because we don't spend every incarnation on the earth. Um, so there are some souls that are traveling uh, elsewhere to uh, to do their work. Um, and so, and, and then, like I said before, there are some that come in on a very frequent basis. There are others who kind of hang back and and don't come here that often. So, so that's the number that um, that that fluctuates. It's it's uh, and and that's an explanation about the what I mentioned earlier about the old souls versus young souls. That's something that Dr. Newton, one of the things that he talked about that I didn't find clicked with with uh, the Casey material or with my own uh research uh so um you know we're not we're not on different tiers there there's not old souls teenage souls young souls baby souls we're all we're all the same age as far as when we were created we just been here some of us have been around a little bit longer on the earth and and uh, gathered uh, a little bit more knowledge about being in a physical body than our counterparts who um you know, prefer to stay in um, in their spirit home. Tell me more about your research project. Um, I want to know, uh, give me an overview of the project itself. Let's talk about participation as well. Okay. We had um, 25 people, and of those, 23 were women and two were men. That was unusual. I usually get more men uh, to be in my research projects, but for some reason... Um, in this particular project, uh, it was mostly the ladies that wanted to participate. The average age was 62. Um, they came from all walks of life. I had a social worker. I had nurses, lawyers, uh, retired flight attendants. I had a historian, um, healing practitioners. So people from um, various professions. Um, and as I mentioned, they regressed to lifetimes that occurred uh, throughout the um, the last uh, 2,000 years. As a matter of fact, I was trying to find 25% of them went to a lifetime that was prior to 1,000 A.D. Oh, wow. Uh, and the bigger number, the majority of them, 36%, went to a lifetime in the 19th century, so sometime in the, um, in the 1800s. Uh, that was my largest group. Um, but then I had people in the 12th century, 15th, 16th century, uh, and some didn't know where what what the time period was, so I didn't quite know how to statistically put their data in. But uh, but it was it was all across the board, and and um, their lifetimes were fascinating. Um, each one of them. Uh, 
I took them through a series of questions. We did the past life first. Then I brought them from that past life. Um, I brought them back up into their current body, their current life. And then I had to back them out again. So then I took them from their current age uh, back to when they were uh, young adults and then when they were children and then they were, when they were toddlers and then baby and then into the mother's womb and then back out again into, the, um, into spirit, so back into the afterlife before they became the person they are today. And that's different also from what Dr. Newton did because he brought them directly from that past life when they would, after they died in that lifetime, he took them directly into the afterlife um, and then back into their current life. I couldn't do that because this is not a linear process. When I say go to your most significant past life, as I mentioned, they were going sometimes 2,000 years in the, in the past. So there was no way to take them from that life into the afterlife immediately preceding the life that they're in now, which is where all the planning took place for this life. So it was a little complicated there. It, it took me a while to figure out how to do that. But uh, then we explored the um, the afterlife. I asked them, what does it feel like to die? What does the afterlife look like? Uh, we talked about their council of elders, their soul's mission, their soul family, all the things that we've already discussed, um, and uh, and then brought them back to the here and now. Did you find any difference among cultural differences uh, as to what the past life experience was or even religious differences? You know, that's interesting because the the religion never came up. It didn't come up in the afterlife. Um, I know uh, Dr. Newton said that his, um, his clients uh, did not ever identify any biblical characters uh, that they would that they would encounter. Yet, almost all of mine did. Uh, when they were talking about the Council of Elders, they would talk about Jesus, Mary, Mary Magdalene, Moses, uh, one of the angels, um, and uh, as being a part of their council. Uh, and but and they also talked about them all, you know, being these many of them on the council being these wise-looking older men with gray hair and gray beards and wearing robes. Um, <clears throat> but as far as what their um, religious background had been when they were in a body, that never came up. The whole concept of heaven and hell never came up. Uh, and the ones who saw some biblical, like if if they saw Jesus, or then, then they're, they emotionally responded to that. There, a lot, there was a lot of weeping, uh, joyful weeping. They felt, they felt honored that Jesus would be on their, one of their guides, one of their council, on their council, helping them plan the next lifetime. So, um, but in terms of their overall experience, it never came up as far as what their cultural or religious background was. Critics of these ideas will often say, well, these are just stories that people have heard over the course of time or they're making them up or whatever it happens mm -hmm. to be. But there's there's research that have been done with children um, that has where they've been regressed and have had memories. And, th and those memories have been fact checked uh, mm -hmm. in the historical record to be and to determined to be true. Um, and these are stories or these are lives and accounts that these children could not have uh, been told or heard. So uh, that adds a lot of credibility to this whole discussion. Are you familiar with that work? Oh, yes. Matter of fact, Dr. Ian Stevenson was the pioneer of working with children in past lives, and he was right here in Charlottesville at the University of Virginia. And the Department of Perceptual Studies now is um, uh, is uh, doing that same work with the, the people who have succeeded Dr. Stevenson. Um, yeah, that, that question of I, uh, or that fear or concern, I'm going to make it all up, uh, is expressed by every single person who comes in for a regression. You know, how do I know I'm not making it up? So I say to them, well, let's think of it this way. Did you say to yourself, I'm going to tell Joanne one heck of a story. I'm going to drive all the way to her office. I'm going to spend two or three hours with her. 
tell her this this fabulous story, and then um, I'm going to pay her for the privilege of listening to me. And of course, that's never the case. And I double check afterwards, and I'll when we go through the the store the uh, regression, and that lifetime, I'll say, do you do you still think you made that up? And they said, absolutely not. They couldn't in their wildest dreams have made up um, some of the especially the ones where they they suffer. Um, there, there's I don't believe they're making it up. And, and, you know, you talk about imagination. Well, where does imagination come from? I mean, you could have a whole study just on that alone. Sure, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, good point. What about some of the challenges you encountered while doing this research, other than maybe critics? <laughs> um, the challenges were, as I mentioned earlier, about how, how to access the afterlife, whether to have them come in from the death in the prior life or have them come in from this life and go backwards um uh so that that created a little bit of a dilemma um uh for me but i managed to get through that um the other one was to be careful and not ask any leading questions one of the things that dr newton did um that i didn't agree with was he would say to them to his client before you you will see a gateway or an entry portal well you know i to me, that's a leading question, so I had to flip it around and say, do you see something like a gateway or an entry portal? That gave them the opportunity to say, no, I don't see that, uh, as opposed to if I say you do see it, then they're going to struggle to try to manifest that because they want to please me, because <laughs> that's the question uh, that I had. So asking the right questions in the right way to let, let them be open-ended so that they have the freedom to say no, I don't see what you're asked, what you're describing, uh, was important to me and to my research. And then, like I said, finding an access point into the afterlife. When you uh, were were doing this, you know, you felt you've got to e- examine and talk about past life mm-hmm. uh, regression itself, and then the life between lives. What's more important? Or are they both equally important? Well, you. Um, it's it's as if the, uh, the the afterlife session is you planning the the life, mm-hmm. and then the life itself is the culmination of that. It, it, uh, how your free will um, enables you to um, work on the issues that you thought you that you said you were going to work on. They're both equally important because one sets the stage for the other, um, and so. It's like, like I said, if you, if you think of Earth as a school, so your past life is going to be you attending this class on the Earth, and then the afterlife is you working with your guidance counselors. You're, you're between semesters. You're on your summer sabbatical, and you're working on your schedule for the following year. Uh, and so you need the past life, and you need to know what went wrong there or what did you accomplish there in order to decide on the classes for when you come into the earth, uh, back to the earth again. What, what you brought up a, a, a story and you mentioned that uh, someone at, at their death of a, in a previous life had uh, thought they didn't want anybody touching them anymore. I think you said mm-hmm. she was a prostitute in the, mm-hmm. in the West. Um, okay. Is our, our, mo- our, our thoughts at the moment of death important in this process? Oh, absolutely. Very important. Um, Cause like I said, um, the, your final thoughts often set up your next life. So, you know, powerful thoughts, especially things like fear and regret, those can serve as the, can be the foundation for the next life. When I ask people um, what some of their thoughts were uh, when their life ended, they, they answered with phrases like, I should have loved more, or I should have done more, or I abused opportunities, or I wasn't kind enough, I didn't accomplish anything. Those thoughts then become the challenge for the next life and circumstances um, are created in in which those those thoughts are going to come up again. So uh, if you have someone who says, uh, I should have loved more, um, they're going to have that opportunity to to do exactly that in the next life. So the next life will be designed around that thought. Describe for us what the afterlife looks like, according to the people that you talk to, your your participants. Um, that was interesting. They uh, they all had very positive things to say. 
um, they talked about it being um, a shift of uh, frequency. They felt very free. There was no judgment, no right or wrong. They talked about swirling energy or floating. Um, they talked about vivid colors and, and beams of light. Uh, so they saw uh, generally they would create something in their mind and it would be there. It would manifest immediately. So if their spirit home, if they wanted it to look like a log cabin, it would be a log cabin. If they wanted it to look like a, uh, a pasture in the Alps, that's where that's where they would go, or they would sometimes they would um, go to a familiar neighborhood. Some of them went into an ancient city or temple, so it, it seemed as though they had the ability to um, to decide what what they wanted uh, what they wanted it to look like once they got there. But as far as what it felt like for them to die, the actual death process, they described it as very gentle and and painless and um most of them said they felt that they were that they either were squeezed or they popped out of their body or they had a hard yank out of their body um they had a sense of freedom and release and uh most of them said they could move around freely immediately after death and and most of them left the scene you know in the um the near death experience people talk about that they hover over the body they can when they come back in then that's how they tell everybody you know, well, I saw this, and I heard you say that, and that. But most of the people who talked about the death experience said that they just left immediately. Um, those who had a traumatic death, um, they, those souls left that body before the physical death actually occurred. So that one uh, man that I had in my study who had been whipped to death uh, said that he had left that body before that body died um, so as to avoid that, that pain. So it was, it was really very fascinating to listen to them describe what happens at that moment. Yeah, you, and you actually just brought up a near-death experience, which I was going to ask you about, because I was curious. We've had a lot of similar reports from people who have had these experiences where it's a very common theme. You know, there's a light. Uh, frequently they're hovering above the bed, particularly if they're in a hospital. They can relate uh, after the fact what was being said, what was being talked about, what was being done. Uh, to their bodies at the time, and that, that's a very common description of a near-death out-of-body experience. And But what I'm hearing from you is the people that actually died, and, and as they were, are recalling that experience, they didn't have that same description. They didn't have that same experience. They saw beams of light, for for sure. They, they um, vivid colors, uh, a sense of floating. I mean, they described that. They mostly said it was a change of, uh, a shift of frequency, but they just didn't hang out with the, the they didn't stay at the place of, uh, at, the, at the place of death. They, like, left immediately to go to the, uh, to go to, to the afterlife, to go to spirit. Um, I think that was almost the only difference. I, I've done some NDE research and, um, uh, and I've always been fascinated to, to compare it to the past life experience, but uh, I haven't really delved into that uh, to know that much about it. But that that whole idea of the the beam of light following that upward, uh, our people saw people in my study saw that as well. I find it interesting, um, and I'm curious as to whether the near-death experience that's often described by people who have come back from that is limited to the fact that they aren't ready for death, and that's why they end up going back into their bodies versus the people that you had regressed uh, or actually and clearly did die, so therefore they wouldn't have had the same experience. Tell me about their about the guide. Tell me about what happens when somebody has an orient orientation session with their guide, how do they describe that? It's is that like a soul guide or a spirit guide? Yeah, I had about eighty four percent of my study group said that they went through this orientation session, which is basically the soul's debriefing session with their primary guide. Um, before they get there, though, eighty eight percent said that they were greeted by a guide of some sort. And they said that they felt welcomed and safe. They were joyful to reconnect. Uh, they recognized this guide from before. So 
it was a familiar face to them, the, someone who's greeted them lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. Um, they uh, talked about some of them bypassed the orientation session completely. Uh, I had some people in my study that were pretty humorous. Um, you know, I don't need this. I'm going to just, I've been here before. Get out of my way. I'm going. I know where I'm supposed to go. I don't need to go to this. You know, so it was, it was kind of funny to watch them because they were, they had personalities on the other side, just like they did here. Um, so the ones that did do it, though, and like I said, they were 84% did have this orientation session. Um, but I think it was like something like 90, 92% talked to their guide. They went like to a garden or on temple steps or a bench or that's what they were describing. And then they would have a welcome message. So their guide would, would welcome them. And, you know, if they needed a little TLC, they'd pat them on the back, uh, give them some encouragement, tell them everything was okay, not to worry about anything. Because some people would come and feel, oh, that was a waste of time. What a wasted life. It was just so worthless. And then, you know, the guys would give them a little pep talk and say, no, it was fine. Um, then they would have a conversation, which was like a basic Q&A. Uh, between the two of them, then the guide would give them some advice, um, and then they would uh, they'd move on. Uh, m most of them would go to meet up with their soul family uh, before they would enter the council chamber. So that would be next on the agenda. Yeah, we need to talk about this council, council of elders. Who are these souls, and what is their role, and are they a fixed group? The council of elders is a group of wise beings, ascended masters, and they've been with you since the beginning. So some have incarnated in um, past lives with you. Others have always been in spirit. They review your progress, uh, just like I mentioned about the guidance counselors would do at school, but their eyes are on the bigger prize. They're, they're watching to, to help you to complete your time on Earth and eventually graduate. Um, most of them appear as ordinary people, but others, as I said, take on the form of biblical characters. Some appear as animals or nature spirits, but they're very loving and they're non-judgmental. Um, they know exactly what we're working on, so they know the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, there's no escaping the truth with them. Um, they don't show impatience. Uh, they don't judge. They just work with you to find solutions to some of the issues that you um didn't quite master. So working with them, we make a list of our karmic issues and attributes, and then we design the, the next time, the next life um, accordingly. And many times they give, you, they give you advice, life advice, before sending you on your way. So does everybody have their own council of elders? Is it yes. unique to that person? Yes. Um, the people in my study, you, uh, most other studies I have read about, uh, you you get five to seven uh, elders. My group, they said five to 20. Um, and then they broke it down into, most of them appeared to be male. Um, I think it was 54% were male, 32% were female, 11% were androgynous, and 3% were nature or spirit entities. They almost all wore robes um, and uh, most everyone identified, as I mentioned earlier, a gray-haired man with a beard. Um, so some of them were like biblical characters, and other were funky characters. They had, like one person said that she saw the someone, a, a guy, an elder that looked like the Dutch boy that was holding his thumb on the dam. I don't know where that <laughs> came from, but somebody else said that that uh, one of the guy, one of their elders looked like Tinkerbell. <laughs> so it was it was like off the wall, and they had. Some of them had names I couldn't even pronounce, and so you're thinking they're not making this up. If this, I had them spell it for me because I just I just didn't get it. Um, I had them describe the council chamber uh, when they walked in, and um, a lot of them described it that it looked like a courtroom to them or a jury with a jury box. Um, and uh, the elders were sitting behind this long conference table, uh, and. Um, uh, it, you know, some of them described a golden hall hall that they were in. Others said there was a dome shaped room. Um, so it was it was it was um, they were they were describing what they 
what would lead them to believe they were going to be judged. If they're saying it looks like a courtroom, some of them said it looked like the floor of the uh, in Washington of the of the uh, Senate. Um, so it was interesting to um, to hear their descriptions. But in the end, they all said the same thing that they weren't judged at all. That these were very loving and kind entities that were there to help them. You also talked about uh, the process of coming back, being reincarnated. You said there was a body selection process. Yeah. How do people, I mean, I can't even imagine. It seems like everybody would want to be, I don't know, pick your favorite supermodel. I don't know who it is, but, um, you know, what, what's that process about? Um, they were given the option of picking the body for the next lifetime, uh, so that would include gender, whether they wanted to be male or female. Um, Casey said that people pick a gender based on what that soul wants to accomplish. So many of the those who wanted to be female in the next life be, wanted to be female because they wanted to experience childbirth or they felt a female body would be more healing or nurturing, whereas those who wanted to be male wanted to be in a strong and powerful body. Some of them wanted to have a body that was as close to the body they had in the previous life because they liked that body. Um, there were layers of both female and male qualities in each, but you generally pick one sex over the other about 75% of the time. So if you gravitate to a male body, uh, that's what you've been maybe, so like I said, 75% of the time you've chosen to be male. Uh, and the same thing with, with the female. But we've been both. We've all been both. Um, so, um, so, yeah, some of them described... Uh, going into a room and that there were higher beings working in there. And some said they would just look on a screen and there would be different bodies and they'd pick one. Others said um, that there was one that was pretty funny. It sounded like it was a dry cleaning business with the bodies just kind of looping around the way the clothes do, you know. <laughs> and then they go, stop, I'll take that one. Uh, but um, but they, they, they did it uh, deliberately. Um, you know, some wanted to be make sure they weren't that beautiful as they were in a previous life because they perceived that that beauty had gotten them into trouble. Uh, some wanted to be athletic, so they, they chose that body. So it was really, uh, it, it w that was new to me. I had never experienced that in any of the work that I had done where they actually went and picked out a body. That never came up before. But I know that Dr. Newton had explored that in his research, so I wanted to do the same thing. Joanne, the book uh, again called "I Did It to Myself Again." What is the what? What do you want people to walk away with after they've read it? I want them to understand that life is continuous; that death is not the end; that this is we're we're all connected to each other. Uh, we're all part of of the oneness that is creation. Um, that we have an impact on each other, that things that happen in their life happen for a reason. It, we don't live in a random universe uh, where these things just, oh, it's just a coincidence. I don't believe in coincidences. Uh, but that it's all part of a plan. It's part of a higher plan. And, and we're, we're a part of that process. We're a part of that decision-making process. And that, you know, use your lifetime now for for working on whatever issue you decided to work on and take it really seriously so that you could put it behind you. And then don't be afraid of passing from this life into into spirit life because um, it isn't anything to be afraid of and it isn't a painful process at all. It's quite beautiful. You're loved, you're, you're nurtured, and, uh, and uh, the universe only wants the highest and best for you. Do you work with people uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis still? Do you do uh, sessions with people? I do, and I, I actually do them not only in person. Well, we, I'm not doing any in person right now, but I do them um, via Skype, um, and uh, which I, I, I found really unusual because I, I sort of resisted that idea. But actually Skype uh, regressions work sometimes better than in person because people are very comfortable in their own home. You know, they can get their own comfy chair and they're not distracted and they feel more relaxed in their own home. So I, I'm doing them um, via Skype these days. I do both the past life regression, the past life regression with soul writing, and then the life between life session. And that's all explained on my website.
Yeah, I was just going to ask. The website's probably the base, best place to go for information about all of that. Right. It, it tells you the difference between the, the, the different uh, sessions that I offer. Terrific. Well, uh, we're out of time, but this has been a really interesting uh, conversation. Your work is really remarkable, and I appreciate you sharing it with us and uh, including a lot of it in the book. Uh, people will certainly get a lot out of that. Well, thank you so much, Javi. I've enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, well, hopefully we'll get a chance to have you back again, too. You seem like you're always working on stuff, so I'm sure you're going to have more things to talk about. <laughs> That's true. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Again, Joanne DiMaggio. Beyond Reality Paranormal is hosted by J.V. Johnson and produced by Orion Palmer and Slick Eddie Edwards. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please consider supporting the program either through your podcast platform, click on the link in the description, or on Patreon at Joha Productions. If you'd like to be a guest on Beyond Reality Paranormal or you have a recommendation for a guest, contact our producer, Slick Eddie Edwards. Eddie is spelled with a Y at slickeddieedwards at gmail.com.